just a short talk about cardiac pacing. Um, it's not a comprehensive talk about pacing as such. It's just a perioperative temporary pacing talk, just uh, to see to to go through how to to deal with uh, with the temporary pacemakers on our ICU and intraoperatively, as this is the only place you'll ever have to manage a, a temporary pacemaker. Um, so we'd be focusing on the practical management rather on uh, and uh, fine details of uh, epicardial pacing. So we're going to talk about the pacemaker code first, followed by the indications for temporary pacemakers, common configurations for temporary pacing in the perioperative phase, and uh, problems with temporary pacemakers and how to solve them. And if you have time, go through a few ECG examples. So the coding is usually five codes. The good news is that for us it's only three because we're not uh, talking about rate modulation or multi-site pacing with temporary leads. So we're only talking about uh, three positions. The first one is a chamber pace and it has to be present, otherwise it would not be a pacemaker. So it's going to be either A for atrium, V for ventricle or D for both. Uh, this is followed by a second um, a letter which is either O, A, V or D. So it can, and that describes a chamber that is sensed. So you don't necessarily have to sense a chamber, you can just pace without <laughs> sensing, in which case it would be an O, um, or you could be sensing the atrium, which would make an A, or the ventricle V or both D. And then the third one is the response to the sense stimulus, which could be either um, there's no particular response, it's just mandatory um, if it's uh, on an O, or it could be triggered by um, a lack of intrinsic uh, activity or inhibited by the presence of intrinsic activity, or it could be both. So it could be T triggered, I inhibited, or D both triggered and inhibited. What are the indications um, after cardiac surgery? Quite often, patients come off relatively bradycardic, which is not good immediately post cardiopulmonary bypass. So uh, we would like to have a reasonable cardiac output. We don't like the ventricle to be over distending in diastole, uh, to not uh, stress it too much and impair um, coronary perfusion. So to avoid bradycardia, um, we do tend to put pacing wires routinely on every cardiac patients and pace them roughly at about a rate of 80. Um, if there's any conduction abnormalities, uh, we also put uh, wires in, and that is particularly um, problematic in patients who have valve replacements who can develop, uh, in particular, third degree heart blocks postoperatively. So if you don't have any ventricular wires in these patients, uh, they could potentially arrest um, and die. So we tend to put sequential wires in, atrial and ventricular wires, if there's any risk of uh, development of AV blocks or generally speaking conduction blocks. Another, this is pretty much the same, another potential benefit of pacing perioperatively is that there is some evidence if you pace somebody electively, it might actually reduce the risk of perioperative onset of atrial fibrillation, um, which is one of our big uh, nemeses. And I think roughly about 20% of our patients, 15 to 20% will develop AF um, perioperatively, typically the moment you want to discharge them to the ward. So potentially, um, Elective pacing at a reasonable rate of maybe 80 or 90 might reduce that incidence, but it's not particularly hard evidence. Um, just talking about the uh, the wires, so we can have single wires, and they tend to be uh, blue, um, both for the ventricle and the atrial. And in order to make sure you know uh, which one is which, um, we have the atrial wires coming out of the right hand side sort of according to anatomy and position of the heart and the chest. And we have the ventricular wires coming out on the left hand side. So that's how you can distinguish them if they're not color coded. Um, our standard wires, however, are quad wires and they are color coded into um, white for atrial and blue for ventricular and they come out at the same location. So it's um, it's easier to to pick up. Um, because I color coded. Uh, so the picture on the right shows you the different ends of those quad wires. 
Um, this is the um, um, sort of um, slightly, um, slightly, this is more like a hook, not a needle end here, which is an atrial wire. So that's only stitched onto the surface of the atrium. It doesn't go through the muscle because the atrium is very thin. It would cause bleeding. If you pull that out, this little hook will simply flatten out and the wire will just slide out. Whereas this is a ventricular wire, <clears throat> which has a needle at the end, which is stitched through the myocardium, and then uh, eventually a part of the wire that's uninsulated further down will be in contact with the myocardium, and the needle and the remaining part of the wire will be cut off. This is quite an important point because the remaining wire sticking out is a potential risk. And we have cases where when this wire end was too long, it could be caught in the um, sternum or the uh, sternal wires. And when you try and pull it out, it then acts like a cheese wire and cuts through the myocardium, potentially causing uh, catastrophic bleeding. So we have to make sure that the end of that wire past the uninsulated, uninsulated part is actually cut off relatively short. So there's no risk of that getting trapped. And this is a quad wire, so both in one, so the atrial here and the ventricular end there. So this is typically what you're going to see, not the other two. So the complications uh, is um, myocardial damage when you put the wires on, bleeding, you might hit a blood vessel. Um, which can lead to significant bleeding and potentially tampon out. Infection, if they're in for a long time, but that is pretty rare. And potentially they could interfere with uh, venous bypass grafts in particular uh, by either compressing them, um, or if you pull them out, you could potentially imagine that the, one of the ends of this wire could actually snag one of the venous grafts. So in particular, um, some, some of our consultants, uh, surgeons are quite reluctant to put these atrial wires on for that reason. So um, with some people, you need to really argue quite hard about atrial wires, and they prefer just to put ventricular wires on. Uh, as the, the risk of uh, any problems when you remove the wire is less than on the, on the atrium. So when you remove them, obviously, you can cause the same problems. You could cause bleeding, you could snag um, a graft cause a problem. And over time, uh, because the end of the wire is uninsulated and attached to the myocardium, which receives uh, an electric pulse uh, for every beat, uh, you, you do in, induce a degree of inflammation in the myocardium, which will eventually cause um, scar tissue and uh, a, a increase in the threshold you need in order to um, to trigger um, uh, electromyocardial coupling at that particular point. So over time, uh, this threshold will rise and you might have to increase the output of your pacemaker until a point arrives where you're not able to pace this particular part of the myocardium anymore. So um, for that reason, it's quite important to keep an eye on that. Um, we usually don't keep wires, temporary wires in for more than four to five days. If there is no reliable rhythm, uh, underlying at that particular point, we would uh, refer to a cardiologist and try and get a pacemaker inserted. Uh, but sometimes, because the patient has infections or his you know, CRP is too high, still on antibiotics, we can't actually put a, t a permanent pacing wire in. So we need to keep this going for probably longer than we like, and we need to keep an eye on the threshold. So typically, we do this uh, twice a day in the morning and the evening to make sure we keep on track of it. Um, and it's important to set the output of the pacemaker safely above the threshold, not just above the threshold, as we um, expect it to rise over time. So I typically use the output as two times the threshold uh, for that particular chamber. So if the threshold was two volt, I set it at four volts, not at 14, that is over the top and it will increase the risk of uh, inflammation and scar tissue formation, and it will speed up the time uh, it will take for the threshold to rise the maximum output of the pacemaker. So don't go excessive, but go safely above the threshold so you don't run into trouble with intermittent pacing. Our daily checks, 
<clears throat> is the underlying rhythm. So to do that, we don't just switch simply switch the pacemaker off or pause it because unless you're sure what the underlying rhythm is, um, and, and there is a sustainable one because obviously it will be very unpleasant for the patient to suddenly become asystolic. Um, so we typically reduce the rate gradually and see what, uh, what the underlying rhythm is until about 40 beats per minute, below which it's pretty irrelevant because um, it's not a sustainable rhythm and rate uh, at, a, at, a, at a rate of less than 40. So we gradually reduce the rate and wait for the myocardium to respond and the underlying rhythm to unmask. Um, that can take some time, seem so to be patient, and it's no point dropping by one beat per minute. So I typically go from, uh, let's say, 80 to 60, 60 to 50, and 50 to 40, and I wait several minutes at each setting to see what the underlying rhythm is. As I said, if this goes on for more than four to five days, you need to talk to your friendly cardiologist about a more permanent solution. Um, so we also did want to see the threshold, which is the minimum output needed for capture of the uh, pacemaker. Um, <clears throat> so you turn the output down and observe the ECG until there is no capture anymore. So you can see the spike of the uh, pacemaker on the ECG and it should translate into electrical activity. If this stops, then you have reached the threshold. You can see the spike of the pacemaker still, but you will not see electrical activity. And obviously the heart rate should drop at that point as well. So once you reach that, you know the threshold and you go safely above it by doubling the output at that particular point. If you know you have a <clears throat> safe underlying rhythm, you can put, press the pause button and on each of the leads, it will tell you the threshold in the relevant um, window in the LCD display. But you can only do that if you know that the patient has a sustainable underlying rhythm. Otherwise, potentially you could have asystole. So to reduce the output until there is no capture is a safer way of going about it in general. Then we look at the um, uh, exit side of the um, uh, wire on the abdomen, make sure there is no obvious infection, inflammation or bleeding. And if you, um, for example, have these wires wrapped up and uh, attached to the abdomen and not to the pacemaker anymore, they may have an insulated end. And I would encourage you not to touch that with your hands because you could potentially cause a microshock through those wires straight onto the epicardium and cause arrhythmias. Um, they have a plastic cap that should be going onto the um, uh, onto the uh, connectors that go into the pacemaker. And when you disconnect them from the pacemaker, you should put this cap on the end of the uh, of the wires to make sure they're insulated and not uninsulated. But some characters tend to rip them off, and so you just need to wrap it in a, a piece of um, gauze or so just to make sure it is it is safe. When you remove them, typically we've, by that time we will have rolled them up because they're not needed anymore and they'll be just uh, in a pouch of uh, gauze on the patient's skin. Uh, check with the surgeons because uh, my rule is you never pull anything out, you can't put back in. So you need to ask the surgeons are they happy for the wires to come out. Check the patient's anticoagulation status and then you can remove them. Uh, typically we do that on day four to five if there is no uh, indication to keep them any longer. Now, if you pull on them, typically you just pull on the on the cable and it will just come out. If there's any resistance, do not uh, use excessive force because what might have happened is that, for example, as I said before, the end of the ventricular wire might have been caught somewhere. And if you then pull too hard, you might cause injury to the um, myocardium and potentially catastrophic bleeding. So at that point, I would call one of the uh, cardiac surgeons to have a look at it, and um, they may decide it's too risky to pull them out, in which case you just gently pull them above, uh, put some uh, traction on the wire, and then cut them flush on the skin, and they will flip back into the subcutaneous tissue and stay there. And that's not the end of the world. It's safer than pulling a wire out that's caught somewhere, uh, causing 
causing trouble uh, uh, as a result. So after you've pulled them out, uh, you obviously need to keep an eye on the patient for signs of bleeding um, or tampon out. So um, some of the surgeons, they keep a small radiovac drain in the uh, pericardium that will be opened at that particular point. And then hopefully, if there's any bleeding, it will show up in the collection bottle. But the chances are by this time, it's day uh, three, four or five, the drain could be clotted. So it's not necessarily a safe uh, way to go about it. So um, others uh, perform a chest X-ray after a certain time, which is also not particularly specific because the uh, it's going to be an AP film and um, uh, because the pericardium was open during surgery, it will be wide anyway on the X-ray, so probably not particularly useful. So the safest way uh, is probably to perform just a screening transthoracic echo, make sure there is no collection. And it's probably useful to do the echo before you pull the wires out because it's not uncommon to have a collection uh, post-surgery um, and then repeat it afterwards and see whether it's the same size or bigger. Otherwise, you will do one after removal and suddenly think, oh crap, it's bleeding, but it's been exactly the same before. You just don't know because you didn't check it. Okay, So if you do an echo, do one before, pull the wires, come back half an hour later and have another look. So then coming to the modes, the most common one we use in theater is VOO. So that is ventricular paste, not sensed and not triggered or inhibited. And the reason for that is that we have a lot of interference in theaters due to diathermia, the surgeon touching the myocardium, the swaps in there, uh, it's a lot of movement going about. So if you have a pacemaker on sensing mode intraoperatively, it tends to be uh, inhibited a lot, uh, which makes uh, for a very unreliable heart rate. And, and that is obviously not desirable uh, immediately um, after coming off cardiopulmonary bypass. So we tend to put it in this mode uh, temporarily until things have settled down. But they should never be used um, long term and certainly not on ICU because of the risk of um, the induction of re-entry tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. So it looks like this. You have um, religiously uh, pacing spikes at the set rate, um, usually followed by a broad QS complex until you eventually come into a position where you have a pacing spike in the refractory period of a spontaneous complex, at which point it cannot elicit uh, uh, electromyocardial coupling. Um, and then the next time there will be another uh, QS complex. So the risk obviously is if this spike falls instead of like here at the beginning of the T wave, if this falls at the end of the T wave, it could cause a re-entry tachycardia and uh, VF, which we try and avoid. Intraoperatively, that's not a big deal. The heart is immediately accessible. We have, um, we have, um, we can shock the patient straight away through the epicardial paddles, but obviously in ICU, that is not the case. So this should be temporary, not um, permanent. The other problem with this method, obviously, it doesn't synchronize the atrium with the ventricle. So you're purely pacing the ventricle and you're losing, in most cases, the atrial component to ventricular filling, which is hemodynamically not good. It's probably okay in patients who have a very good LV, but in patients who have an impaired LV, and most of ours do, it's not ideal to uh, simply pace somebody ventricular and uh, forego the atrial component of ventricular filling. So as soon as you can, you should go to a, a sequential synchronous mode where you coordinate the atrium and the ventricle um, through the pacemaker. Uh, it typically is also the um, one of the uh, default modes in the pacemaker for emergency pacing. So if you have uh, single um, channel pacemakers, it will be VOO. If you have dual channel pacemakers, it will be DOO. Um, and the reason is that it's the most reliable emergency rhythm because it overcomes all the problems I was just talking about, like electrical interference, uh, etc., that might inhibit the pacemaker um, inappropriately. So if you press the emergency button on your um, pacemaker, it will typically come up with either that or DOO. <clears throat> 
But again, it should not be a long term solution, but an emergency pacing mode until you figured out what's wrong. The next uh, mode we, we use frequently is VDI. So you're pacing ventricular, you're sensing ventricular, and the pacemaker is inhibited by intrinsic activity. So for that reason, it needs to be sensing the ventricle. Um, so you can see the, uh, um, the output here. So it's uh, 8.5 volts and the sensing here, which is uh, 2 millivolts and a rate of 80. Uh, every time the uh, pacemaker is uh, pacing, there will be a little light flashing next to the uh, output selector. And every time the ventricle is sensing, there will be a light opposite the sensing um, um, value. So you can actually see what's going on just by looking at those, those two lights. Um, you don't necessarily have to look at the ECG. So if the patient's intrinsic rate is, 80, uh, is 60 and you put this pacemaker at 80, it should flash uh, 80 times per minute on the, um, on the output side here. If the patient's um, rate exceeds the set rate of the um, pacemaker, you should see the sensing light flashing at the patient's intrinsic rate. And then if it drops again below the set rate of the pacemaker, it should start pacing again and you should see the flash on the ventricular pacing lead. And this is how the ECG will look then. So you have a pacing spike, a broad complex QS complex, pacing spike, broad complex QS complex. Here is an intrinsic uh, P wave and QS complex. So this is being sensed by the uh, pacemaker and it will be inhibited as a result. Then it will wait for a while for the next complex, which doesn't come, and therefore it will pace again, and it will pace again. So an R and T phenomenon is impossible in this situation, providing the sensing threshold is actually set properly. So when we do, we, do we use this? If there is chronic AF, there's no point putting atrial wires on. You can only pace uh, the ventricle, so we, um, we do that. And uh, as I mentioned before, some surgeons are very reluctant to put atrial wires on. So in this case, that's just simply the only lead you have. And you can use that for rate control uh, or in the, um, in the um, event of a AV block to control the patient's heart rate. But as I said before, similar to VOO, you lose the AV synchrony. You, um, you um, have uh, suboptimal left ventricular filling, and that can significantly reduce your cardiac output um, by about 20 to 30 percent, which, you know, as I said before, is, is probably OK in somebody with a very good LV who's lying in bed, but in somebody with an ejection fraction of 20 percent, that's a, a significant drop. And it might be the difference between being in cardiac failure or not. So a sequential synchronized pacing mode is always um, preferable. The next uh, option we might find on, on ICU is AAI. So atrially paced, atrially sensed and inhibited by intrinsic activity. So you have the rate populated, the atrial sensing threshold and the atrial output. And again, if you're, in a, if you're actively pacing, uh, the light opposite the output should be flashing. If your um, patient's intrinsic rate exceeds the pacemaker rate, the sensing light should be flashing. Um, the sensing for the atrium is typically set at about 0.2 to 0.5 uh, millivolt, and the output depends on the threshold you determine, so twice the threshold to be on the safe hand side. The ECG will look like that. So you have a um, pacing spike followed by P wave, normal AV conduction, narrow complex, QS complex. Um, it has an intrinsic P wave, which is picked up by the pacemaker. It's inhibited, it's normal conduction. Then there's a pause, there's no intrinsic P wave. As a result, the pacemaker will stimulate the atrium again and um, the patient is paced. Here's an uh, extra systole and it's unable to pace uh, to, to uh, have capture at this particular point. Um, but that's just um, an example of potential interference with uh, with the pacemaker. 
Um, so this um, is not a particularly safe mode if you have any kind of uh, risk of um, a problem with the AV node. So as a sole pacing mode for patients who are at risk of uh, AV blocks, it's not safe. But in patients who are just in sinus bradycardia, it's the most physiological way to pace. The most common mode, however, is uh, dual chamber pacing. So this could be in the form of DDD, DVI, or DOO. And these are the, um, sorry, these are the configurations. So in DDD, you have the rate populated ventricular sensing and output. This um, middle window here is the AV delay, so the delay between the administration of the atrial and the ventricular pacing spike and then the ventricular output and the ventricular sensing. <clears throat> if you do go for DVI, you have taken out the um, atrial sensing um, option and it will only sense the ventricle, hence DVI. In DOO, you've taken both sensing um, options out and you simply pacing without sensing. You achieve that by increasing the uh, sensing threshold um, to the maximum, and then eventually you see those two bars, which means now it's not sensing at all. Initially, you see rising numbers, and then those two bars. And if you want to uh, um, activate sensing again, you just reduce the threshold with this uh, button until the numbers appear and dial in what you uh, what you typically um, use. So for atrial about uh, 0.2 to 0.5 millivolts and um, for the ventricle 1 to 2 millivolts. So the configuration on the ECG would look like that. Uh, it's able to sense um, both um, chambers. So in this case there's intrinsic atrial and ventricular activity. So the uh, pacemaker is not reacting at all. It's um, inhibited by sensing those activities. Then it will wait. There's an intrinsic P wave, hence the atrial wire is inhibited. It will wait the set AV delay, which was, I think, 180 milliseconds on this setting. Um, and then if there is no uh, QS complex, it will pace the ventricle, which happens here. There's a pacing spike. It's a broad complex QS complex, as opposed to the intrinsic narrow one. Then it waits for the uh, intrinsic P wave, which doesn't happen. So it will pace the atrium, followed by P wave. It waits for the, um, uh, the standard AV delay. It's set 180 milliseconds for ventricular activity. There is none sense, so it will pace the ventricle, and so forth. Um, so it is uh, the most um, versatile, the safest way of, um, of pacing somebody. Um, and even if this patient was uh, going to develop a third degree heart block at some point, you would still have sequential pacing between um, and synchronized uh, between the atrium and the ventricle, as opposed to uh, AI, where you would have a systole, a ventricular systole, because the AV node is blocked. So this is a safer option if you think that uh, an AV conduction defect might be a possibility in the future. Um, so certainly in somebody who has LV dysfunction, uh, who needs um, the optimal cardiac output, this is a much better option than just ventricular pacing. So this is probably what you're going to find in, in most situations. So just a quick word about the AV delay, which is this middle number here. Um, it can be modified with this adjustment button here, and that's quite useful uh, for the following reasons. So at number one, it, it changes with heart rate. The higher the heart rate, the shorter the AV delay. Um, so it's typically around about 150 to 180 milliseconds uh, within normal heart rate um, settings. Um, but obviously what, what happens is if you have somebody who has a first degree heart block and you're pacing him with an AV delay of 150 milliseconds, you typically, uh, you will pace his ventricle. You won't give his AV node a chance to uh, um, have normal AV conduction um, 
and um, excite the ventricles through the His bundle in a much more physiological way, uh, rather than through the um, the wire on the on the right ventricle. So this leads to a much less efficient contraction of the left ventricle, which is then polarized or depolarized, I should say, from a, a random point on the right ventricle, and the um, excitation just runs across the myocardium in a uh, disorganized uh, asynchronous fashion. Whereas if the ventricle is triggered by the normal conduction system, it contracts at the same time in all areas. So sometimes uh, it's actually useful to override this. And I've done that here by increasing um, the uh, AV delay to 280 milliseconds, so way beyond uh, a, a, the threshold for a first degree heart block. And sometimes that's be enough for the, uh, for the patient to uh, have uh, AV conduction and normal excitation of the LV through the um, conduction system. And you can see that here. So on the left hand side is a 140 millisecond AV delay. We're pacing atrium and ventricle sequentially. The white markers are the pacing spikes. The brown markers is simply an indication of where the, um, the monitor thinks the QS complex is. So the brown marker has nothing to do with the pacemaker. It's always there to mark the uh, QS complex. So here we're pacing atrium ventricle, atrium ventricle, and we have a broad complex QS complex. Now I've re increased the um, uh, AV delay to 280 milliseconds, and you can see that you're still pacing the atrium, and there's a P wave, but now we have a normal QS complex and no pacing spike, just the brown QS indicator. So this has now allowed the patient to go through its normal conduction system and the ventricle is excited through the His bundle rather than the lead on the right ventricle. This can make a big difference hemodynamically, especially in patients with borderline um, left ventricular function. The graphics are lagging behind a bit. <clears throat> okay, now we're coming uh, to some problems with pacemakers. So the most common problem is failure to capture. So you have a pacing spike here, you have a broad complex QS complex, you have another pacing spike and nothing happens. So what's what's the problem? Any? No, what's the problem? Yeah. There's no capture because mm, not the threshold. The output, yeah. So the output is probably too borderline, it's probably too close to the threshold and it will pace occasionally and at other times not. So the capture is not reliable. There's capture here again, but not in, in this case. So in order to overcome that, you just have to increase the um, output. Either your threshold has risen over time, which I said is, is normal for temporary pacing bias, so you need to adjust your pacemaker, um, or there could be a problem with the actual um, part of the myocardium the, uh, the wire is attached to. In the worst case scenario, it could be a, um, um, an infarction, um, which could probably lead to your wire failing entirely over time. So if you can't sort this out with a moderate increase in threshold in, in, in um, output, you might have to think about something like that. But that's pretty rare. Usually, simply the threshold is risen and you have to increase your output. Another thing to check as a default anyway, if your pacemaker is playing up, make sure your leads are attached properly. And quite often, uh, people don't put the wires into those connectors in the pacemaker very well, and uh, there could be a loose connection. So make sure that's all uh, seated properly and connected properly, because it could be as simple as that. Um, the next option is um, that the, uh, the um, pacemaker is failing to pace. And uh, the, uh, the reason for that is typically that the pacemaker is set too sensitive so it picked something up, in this case around here, where it assumes there was myocardial activity and it inhibits the pacemaker. Um, 
But if there wasn't any myocardial activity, it leads to a drop of this particular beat. And in the worst case scenario, to a systole. So um, if the pacemaker is too sensitive, we call it oversensing, and uh, this can cause to a failure to pace. And your, uh, your way to uh, modify that is you decrease your sensitivity. So that makes the number higher. So if your sensitivity was, let's say, um, 0.2 millivolts on the atrial lead and it's over sensing, you go up to 0.5 or 1 millivolt. So you make it less sensitive, the number increases. Okay, And the same on the ventricle. If the setting was 1 millivolt sensing and it is over sensing and inhibiting the pacemaker, you go up to 2 or 3 millivolt um, sensing threshold. And if you can't solve it, you can go temporarily to a non-sensing mode, so VOO, DOO, in order to establish a reliable cardiac output, and then think about what the problem could be or ask for help. Okay? But again, this should not be the final solution for the rest of the night. It should be temporary. <clears throat> and then the, the next, the third most common problem is failure to sense. So you have a pacing spike, broad complex, QS complex. There's an extrasystole here, and there's a pacing spike right at the end of the extrasystole. So the pacemaker was not able to pick up this extrasystole. And the reason for that is most likely that the pacemaker's sensing threshold was set too high. So uh, this uh, electrical impulse was not enough to trigger uh, the sensing lead on the pacemaker. So you have to make it more sensitive so the number has to come down. So if you, for the ventricular lead, were maybe at three or four millivolts, you would have to reduce it to maybe two or one in order to allow it to sense intrinsic activity and not pace inappropriately at the end of an extra sister leaf like here, and in this case here, uh, which is pretty close to the, uh, to the point where it could quite easily trigger a uh, um, an R and T phenomenon. So that is failure to sense um, caused by um, the, um, the pacemaker to be too um, uh, insensitive. So you have to increase its sensitivity. Um, just a quick word about uh, electromyocardial myocardial interference, EMI. Um, the most common one is intraoperatively uh, electrocautery and mono monopolar, which we typically use, is much more significant than bipolar. Uh, nerve stimulators potentially can cause the same problem. And if the patient has uh, muscle fasciculations or shivering, it can also be picked up by a, a pacemaker wire. Um, as do very large tidal volumes. We're not talking about 500, 600 mils, but maybe a liter or more, um, because it can shift the, uh, the, um, um, the pacing wire uh, physically and cause interference from that point of view. And obviously, external defibrillation will most certainly do that, <clears throat> uh, and um, which shouldn't really happen. MRI can. And there's a whole other issue about going to an MRI with somebody with pacing wires because it is obviously not a, um, not an easy thing, and they can heat up with the, with the um, uh, induction of the uh, of the magnets and cause myocardial damage. <clears throat> so in summary, um, intraoperatively, we quite often use a non-sensing mode to avoid uh, electromyocardial interference. This is fine intraoperatively while you keep an eye on the patient. As soon as the source of the EMI is, um, is gone, like the diathermy and the patient's chest is being closed, you should uh, change that to a synchronous sensing mode. <clears throat> and certainly at the latest when you turn up on ICU. So no patient should turn up with these two pacing modes on ICU. But nevertheless, if you admit a patient to ICU, make sure as part of the handover you check the pacing box and the, um, the pacing mode and uh, make sure uh, it's safe. Um, whenever possible, aim for sequential AV pacing to improve cardiac output. If appropriate, try and increase your AV delay in order to allow normal AV conduction. 
uh, to in uh, to facilitate a better LV uh, contraction um, as opposed to the uh, the paste um, con contraction. Um, check your pacemaker twice daily for underlying rhythm and pacing threshold, and never ever just stop the pacemaker, but follow uh, my advice by just reducing the rate gradually and being patient, waiting for a minute or two for the underlying rhythm to unmask itself. And um, yeah, as a slight sort of sideline, elective postoperative pacing may reduce the incidence of atrial fibrillation. Okay, that's it. Any questions? Sorry? When you pick it in RMT, can you use the pacing box to out-pace it and bring it back, or would you need to shock You're better off to shock the patient, yeah. <clears throat> you're already in, I mean, if you're in VF, you know, you won't be able to outpace that with a pacemaker anyway. Yeah. So you need to shock, yeah. In, in atrial fibrillation, you may be able to, I would suspect, depending on the atrial fibrillation rate. <clears throat> so that's an uh, ECG. Talk me through that. What's uh, what's happening? What can you see? So the, the easiest uh, um, trace to look at is usually the rhythm trace at the bottom. So what can you see? Is this a normal QS complex? Yeah, this one? Yeah, this one? Not. So there's a little pacing, it's very small. There's a little pacing spike here. There's a broad complex QS complex as opposed to a narrow complex. Again, 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 two normal ones, and then paste, 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 paste. So what pacemaker setting is this most likely? Yeah, so it has to be a sensing mode. It has to be sensing the ventricle. Otherwise, it would have kept pacing um, in, in these um, occasions and potentially cause uh, RNT phenomenon. But um, it was pacing here and then it was inhibited twice and it's pacing again, so it needs to be sensing. So it's most likely VVI. It could be uh, DDD as well, um, if there are any P waves, which actually I can't necessarily see here. But yeah, so VVI is, uh, is, the, most, um, is the most likely one. So if the if there were p, uh, p waves here, uh, then it could be a DDD uh, setting as well, sensing the um, the p wave all the time and therefore not pacing the uh, the atrium. Okay, what's happening here? There's a spike. QS complex spike. QS complex. Hmm? And you see, do you see uh, any P waves? There, 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 there. Are they uh, in a fixed relationship with the uh, pacing spike? Or are they just random? They're fixed. So there's a, a P wave followed by a, a pacing spike on a regular basis all the time. Okay, and the the distance between the P wave and the pacing spike is the same. So what what is the setting on this pacemaker? V O O H V seven. So if it was if it was A A I, would it pace would it pace the ventricle? No. <laughs> But what, what did I say is the most common setting? Okay, it's most likely DDD. So it's a patient who has normal sinus rhythm. So the, uh, the pacemaker doesn't need to pace. It's sensing the atrium. So it has to be um, sensing the atrium. That is, um, that is mandatory here. And then it's pacing the uh, ventricle all the time at a set um, AV delay. So it's most likely a DDD pacemaker with a relatively short AV delay. This is 200 milliseconds, so this will be maybe 150 milliseconds, okay? <clears throat> so it's most likely DDD. 
this would be very odd to use just VDD. Yeah, okay. But that is a potential um, alternative answer to that. <clears throat> What's happening here? What's that? H will pacing spike followed by P wave. And then is that a normal or paste QS complex? Normal. And then is this the same throughout? Yeah. Same pattern throughout. Oops. Oh, sorry, I clicked <laughs> I clicked too early. But never mind. I mean we obviously already said it's H really paste. Um, and then so what what pacing mode could that be? That there's multiple options now. So that could be AAI, but you're not sure because you have on no occasions uh, an example where there's intrinsic atrial activity. Mm -hmm. So this could be uh, AOO with an underlying atrial rate less than the, the set pacing rate. Uh, so it simply, you know, paces above the patient's intrinsic rate, but it's not sensing it. The only time you could say it's sensing if you actually had uh, an episode where there is intrinsic um, an intrinsic P wave and no spike at the same time or around it. So that you can't necessarily say that. So it could be AOO, it could be a, um, AI, or it could be EDD. Yeah. So lots of things. You can't say unless you uh, actually see any intrinsic activity. <clears throat> Is that clear? Yeah. What's that? It's a bit tricky because the pacing spikes are very, very small. So I show a pacing spike here, broad complex QS complex, pacing spike here, broad complex QS complex, and pacing spike here, and then nothing. Hmm? Uh, it's failure to pace, yeah, because of. Yeah, it's most likely oversensing. It's things there is something here, but there isn't. And what's happening here? Spike with the QS complex, and there is a P wave intrinsic QS complex, and that's a spike at the end of the T wave followed by broad complex QS complex. What happened at this particular point or at this particular point? It's it could become an RNT, but what happened is that the, the ventricular wire has fired inappropriately at a point where it should have been inhibited by the intrinsic um, complex that has just followed, uh, just, just preceded it. So it's not it's not sensing appropriately the intrinsic activity and fires um, uh, inappropriately. So that could mean what? It's under sensing or exactly it could be in a VOO mode and not sensing at all. But in either case, uh, it can be um, a risk of um, RNT phenomenon. Oops, sorry. So it's failure to sense. So what, what do you do as a result? What do you adjust? <clears throat> so the pacemaker is set, so its sensing threshold is higher than the output of the intrinsic, um, uh, in, intrinsic activity. So you need to reduce the ventricular threshold, make it more sensitive so it's able to pick this up. Um, until it can do that, um, it, it will not avoid the inappropriate pacing. So it, the threshold has to be lowered to a point where it's able to, to pick up the intrinsic activity. Um, and um, in this case, you can just, because you know there is an intrinsic rhythm, you could just press the pause button. And if you look at the ventricular wire, um, um, in the LCD display of the uh, of the pacing box, it will tell you the threshold in that box. Okay, so you know what that is, and you have to go um, below that. Okay. <clears throat>
And that's just a few references. Um, Right, so yeah, my name's Tom. I'm one of the anaesthetics trainees. Uh, I've been asked to present the uh, above article, which was recently released in Critical Care. So this is low dose culture scene in patients after non cabbage cardiac surgery, a randomised controlled trial. So just a bit of background to this. So culture scene is broadly speaking some kind of anti-inflammatory medication uh, used in gout and familial Mediterranean fever, whatever that is. Um, it's got a relatively narrow therapeutic index. Uh, the common side effect is uh, diarrhoea, uh, but it causes gastrointestinal upset. There's a, a kind of growing body of evidence that suggests it might have a role in the cardiovascular setting. So there's been some trials in acute myocardial infarction that show some efficacy. And relevant to this, there's been some trials looking at uh, culture scene reducing the incidence of post cardiac surgery AF um, and these have been backed up by kind of subsequent meta-analyses so there is a, a some body of evidence that suggests it might be beneficial. So the design of this trial so this was an investigator initiated single centre single blind randomised placebo controlled clinical trial so just from that title it ticks a few of the boxes in terms of the design I'll go through the design and methods in a bit more detail now and just pick out the kind of good and the bad, basically. Uh, so the good stuff is that they completed the trial within a reasonable time frame. So that suggests they didn't run into any kind of massive methodological problems. Um, and it was only two years, so that's not too bad. Uh, they appear from the manuscript to have gone through all of the appropriate ethical approvals and they pre-registered the trial on a registry, which is always a good, a good point. Uh, it's randomised and they used a fairly standard way of randomising, just a one to one ratio. Uh, the dose of culture seen is fairly appropriate and the duration of the intervention seems fairly appropriate as well. So they gave culture, culture scene from three days pre-op to five days post-op. Uh, they make a comment saying they kind of make an effort to make sure all of the other treatments, so all of the surgical and anaesthetic intervention was standardised as much as it could be. Uh, it's coming off the top of the bottom of the screen here, but it says oh, oh. Uh, the placebo was just reasonably well made. So they, they made a placebo tablet, basically. Um, so the indifferent stuff is in the middle column. So it's a single centre uh, based in China and it recruited probably a small amount of patients in, the, in terms of kind of clinical trials. So that's immediately going to kind of limit any external validity of the trial. The inclusion and exclusion criteria. So in the red box, I've highlighted, I've just copied all of the inclusion and exclusion criteria. I've highlighted a couple. They haven't come out too well, but basically a couple of the exclusion criteria was anyone with, with coronary artery disease and anyone with a predicted mortality of above 3%. So basically they're saying that they just want to study low risk patients essentially. And whether, again, that's going to kind of limit your external uh, validity of the findings really. Um, they use a biochemical outcome as their primary outcome. So if you look in the blue box, the primary, their primary outcome that the whole study is powered for is looking for a reduction in cardiac troponin T levels at 48 hours post-op, so post-operative day two, which is probably okay for kind of early studies, but it's completely clinically meaningless really. You know, patients don't care if they're cardiac troponin T level is low, lower 48 hours post-op and it needs to be established whether that reduction in cardiac troponin T translates into any clinical benefit basically. Um, so I've just listed the other secondary outcomes. So they use a number of other uh, kind of biomarkers to do with the myocardium and oh, yeah, uh, to do with the myocardium some inflammatory biomarkers. They also collected data on some clinical outcomes, so stuff that we would be more interested in, which is stuff like your 30-day mortality and your occurrence of stroke and use of renal replacement therapy, etc. Uh, but obviously with any of the secondary outcomes, the study isn't powered to detect any difference. So if there is a difference, you have to interpret it with caution. Um, so on to the power calculation. 
So these are always a little bit tricky to interpret. Basically, they, they have made a reasonable power calculation. So they've said that they think they're going to be able to, de to detect a 30% reduction in cardiac troponin T with 90% power. So that means they accept a false negative rate of 0.1. It's actually a little bit better than most studies, most power to 80%. So they accept a false negative rate of 0.2 and a two-sided two alpha, so that's your p-value, your false positive rate of 0 0.05. And you know, when you're designing a study, the power calculation tells you how many participants you need to recruit. So if, you, if this group picked 30-day mortality and did a power calculation, it would tell them they probably have to recruit 2,000 people, so they're obviously not going to do that. So they're going to pick a primary outcome that they can recruit to. Therefore, the power calculation is always a bit difficult to interpret because you just pick one that you can recruit to, basically. Um, the bad stuff in the third column is that it was single blinded. So they mentioned that they've blinded the patients, the outcome assessors and statisticians, but they didn't blind the clinicians giving the treatment. It's not ent entirely clear why. Um, there's always a cost associated with double blinding. It adds layers of kind of extra bureaucracy when you're running a trial. But they don't really say why they didn't why they didn't do it, and it's just a, an important potential source of bias in the trial. So results. So just to say that the baseline characteristics were well matched between the culture scene and the placebo group. Uh, the patient flow diagram on the top right. So there's a relatively high level of exclusion. So they only recruited 132 people, and 136 declined to participate and we don't really know why that is they don't mention that is that's either because patients don't want to take culture scene for whatever reason or it's some way that the trial is being run or something like that but it's just important to factor in this reasonably high level of exclusion uh, to my eye it seems like a slightly heterogeneous selection of procedures so the table down the bottom half so they have included uh, surgeries of valves of ascending aortas some atrial myxoma resections as well um, i don't really have a good grasp of whether those procedures kind of represent a similar physiological stress or impact on the myocardium but it's again a potential source of heterogeny in the results um, looking at the same table right down the bottom there are some differences in medication use between the culture scene group and the placebo group Again, I'm not quite sure how well that's coming out, but basically the culture scene group was taking more beta blocker and more ACE inhibitor. And when your primary outcome is a cardiac biomarker, it's not kind of inconceivable to think that the beta blocker or the ACE inhibitor might be affecting some of those levels or at least interacting in some way. So it's just another potential source of bias. Uh, so onto the results. So these are the biomarker results. So the baseline biomarkers were similar between groups at, at the beginning, so that's always good. Apart from randomly this IgG level, which was higher in, culture scene, in the culture scene group, I'm not really sure if that had any impact on the results, but just interesting to note. Uh, the primary outcome, so levels of cardiac troponin T on postoperative day two, so they were significantly lower in the culture scene group. Um, the table, the top half of the table on the right, so Interestingly, the, the difference between the culture scene and placebo group was present from post-operative day one right through to post-operative day five. So it seems like quite a strong, strong reduction in um, levels of cardiac troponin T when taking culture scene. And that's just highlighted on the graph on the bottom left. Um, and some of the secondary outcomes were significant as well. Obviously, you have to interpret these as caution with caution, but cardiac troponin I CKMB, IL-6 and procalcitonin were all lower in the culture scene group. Um, they collected some safety data, which is just interesting to know. Uh, again, it's not powered to detect changes here, but these are just interesting to know. So culture scene group had lower rates of something called post-pericardiotomy syndrome, lower rates of pleuritic chest pain, lower rates of pleural effusion, but more gastrointestinal upset. Uh, where there were no differences between the groups, so this is your kind of more clinically interesting outcomes, so 30-day mortality, 
intraoperative uh, in, intraaortic balloon pumps, ECMO use, stroke, renal replacement therapy, there was no events in either group. So just again, highlighting that this is a fairly low risk cohort. Um, there were no differences in the rates of ST elevation, left bundle branch block AF. There were no differences in intensive care length of stay or hospital length of stay. So my interpretation. So this is a pretty small trial run from a single centre in China, and that obviously limits any extrapolation to other populations. Uh, they did find a significant difference in their primary outcome. But as I've said already, you know, so what really? Um, it doesn't it hasn't translated any, into any clinical clinically meaningful difference between the groups and as i said it would be interesting to know how many people they would need to recruit if they wanted to detect a difference in mortality for example um yeah i've just included this this the study the top study there was a fairly big and robust meta-analysis of interventions that target the innate immunity response to cardiac surgery that was done by the cardiac surgeons here they didn't look at culture scene but basically none of the interventions they looked at worked um, the, the group excludes cabbage and coronary disease patients so again is that applicable is this study applicable to our patient group or some of our patient group um, it's an ultra low risk group as we've said so again this bmj open study was done in cardiac in uk cardiac centers and it basically tried to establish what what was what explained the variance in outcome in cardiac surgery um, and it, it was essentially 95 or above 95 percent of the variation in in outcomes was just based on the patient's baseline state so their comorbidities the surgeons had a little bit of influence and interestingly the anesthetist's influence was completely negligible in terms of affecting outcomes um, they excluded some people that got diarrhea from further analysis. So all of the people that got diarrhea were in the culture scene group. They stopped taking culture scene and they stopped having their blood taken. So that data isn't available, which is fair enough. It's a per protocol analysis, but it is a biomarker study, whereas we tend to prefer kind of clinical outcomes and intention to treat analyses, but just interesting to say. And it's using an agent with a slightly unclear mechanism of, of action. So they measured a load of inflammatory outcomes and some of them were different, but a lot of them were no different between the groups. So we still don't really know what culture scene is doing in this setting. So my bottom line from this, is this paper practice changing? No, it's a small but relatively well-designed trial, but with limited external validity and some potential important sources of bias. Is it worth further investigation? Um, I'm not sure. There's a relatively high rate of side effects. You don't really know the acceptability of the intervention to patients. We just know that, that more patients that took part in the trial declined to take part in the trial. We don't really know why. Uh, reproducing results from this type of trial is almost impossible. There is some growing body of evidence to suggest that culture scene does something in the cardiovascular setting, but again, we don't really know why. Um, but to investigate it further, you do need to do these kind of studies to kind of justify further funding. No one's going to fund a large multi-centre interventional trial looking at proper outcomes without this kind of trial having been done beforehand. So you kind of have to do it in a way. Um, yeah, pharmacological prehabilitation and perioperative interventions. So there's a bit of a trend into looking at all these drugs and trying to repurpose them and seeing if they impact outcomes in the perioperative period so culture scene is just is obviously designed for for gout but it's being repurposed so it's fairly attractive because it's relatively cheap and uh relatively not labor intensive so although in the ideal world you'd get everyone before their cardiac surgery, exercising and eating a really healthy diet and all the rest of it, those interventions are just too intensive and costly and people just don't do them. So a tablet is a lot easier. Um, and interestingly, the group has already planned to do a similar trial in bypass patients. So it would be interesting to see the results of that. Um, 
this was supposed to be 10 minutes. I was going to bore you about the reproducibility crisis, but I think I've run out of time. Uh, does anyone have any questions about anything or have a burning desire to, for me to go through this slide? Is anyone still there? Thanks, Thanks. to all my notes. The topics for today have been a little bit dry and a little bit difficult um, to, to listen to after lunch, really. Um, <laughs> but um, just listening to your presentation, I'm not entirely sure what to make of it um, because troponin levels go up postoperatively in a cardiac patient anyway. Um, we hardly hold any stock by that. We don't measure post-op troponins um, on the unit unless we think that there has been, um, you know, a problem with the reperfusion, has there been a problem with the grafts, or, you know, one of those things that the patient has had another MI. Um, we wouldn't measure troponins anyway. And as you pointed on one of your slides, they didn't, you know, they didn't actually look at the things that matter in terms of morbidity and mortality, i.e., you know, um, number of days ventilated, number of, you know, if they need acute kidney injury and if they needed renal replacement therapy. You know, none of those things were actually looked at. So an isolated biochemical marker is not really very exciting for us to actually look at. And if anything, if you're going to be giving somebody a drug that gives them, you know, gut problems postoperatively, um, that's more a nuisance than anything else, especially if the patients have already got, you know, are on anotropes like dopamine and and we are struggling with nausea vomiting postoperatively after extubation, you then add in something like this that's going to cause more of a um it, in my mind, it's more a nuisance factor than anything else, and I don't think it really adds very much. The fact that it is an anti-inflammatory might be useful in, you know, the pericardiotomy syndrome that you mentioned, which is basically inflammation of the of the pericardium, which sometimes you see on the unit on ECG with, you know, saddle shaped ST elevation, which we all ignore because we know that's just pericarditis and postoperative pericarditis. So I'm not really sure that this is really of much value. Yes, main value is probably them justifying more trials. So that's probably why they yeah. did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's my uh, this and it's it's more, yeah, let's find a novel use for a drug that's been here for hundreds of years. So I guess if there's no other comment, so um, thank you very much. Thank you both, Mike and uh, Tom.